Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Venice. One amazing place, one amazing uh, day today. Um, it is only suiting for us to come together and discuss climate how, how to engage um, society and deploy decarbonization. We are at a pivotal time in our history, and it is so suiting that we come and gather here in Venice, a city at the front lines of climate change, where history is literally being flooded by rising sea levels caused by global warming. We know climate change is real. We see it on a daily scale. And just yesterday, the World Meteorological Organization again let us know that the last 10 years have been the warmest on record. Um, it is here. And the question really is, how do we address it? How do we uh, transition to a low carbon, a decarbonized, and resilient future? Um, <clears throat> but that challenge, this generation's challenge, is really our opportunity. And already we're seeing it in terms of the deployment of renewable energy, in terms of the scaling up of energy efficiency, climate smart agriculture, um, smart mobility, city level solutions. Things are happening all around the world, and you're all part of that. And with that, we, we really want to welcome world-class scientists, um, economists, academics, private sector leaders, um, leaders from civil society, from governmental and non-governmental organizations to inspire us today and share with us how they are um, addressing this generation's challenge. So thank you so very much for joining us. We're, uh, we're live streaming today, so please engage with us with the hashtags, hashtag climate how, um, as well as five symposium, because this is the fifth symposium. Um, <clears throat> and to join the broader conversation, use also hashtag climate change. Um, and with that, I would like to invite Ambassador Umberto Vitani. Thank you so very much for joining us. And, and if, if you could come up on stage and um, Welcome today's audience and introduce today's session. Um, uh, Mr. Vatani is the president of the Venice International University, and he's a, a well-known and renowned ambassador for Italy. Thank you so very much. Well, I had a very generous offer um, this morning, five minutes to give you a very warm welcome. This is much more than what I get at home and where I never have, in any case, the last word. Uh, you have reached this island easily this morning, but you'll find that it's hard to leave. This is an advantage because it helps you concentrate and focus on the matter at hand. I had a quick glance at the speaker's list and the participants. Well, one cannot help feeling that you all belong to the top league. Uh, the students and professors of our university also rank with the best. We only take A students here. Um, have a look at our network. These are the universities which belong to our réseau. Now, Charles V used to boast that his dominions were such that the sun never set. Uh, we have a larger one. When uh, our Japanese, Chinese, and Korean friends have ended their day's work, uh, we still are in the office, and our American friends are still to wake up. Uh, so you can see that we work around the clock in some way. Um, I'll show you how this started, and the gentleman who had the vision uh, to create this university on this island. His name is Carlo Azzelio Ciampi, who was at the time Minister of Finance and later was elected President of the Republic. He, uh, he renounced uh, to uh, leading this university only then. So we have a wonderful uh, origin and we're very proud of that. Um, we need you, we need all of you. And uh, I would like to say that uh, this meeting is a wonderful opportunity to see how we can enhance interaction, synergy among ourselves, since most of the subjects that we deal with, and you will see from the next slide, 
are basically all global issues. And among these, some that Max just um, listed a moment ago, climate change, uh, sustainable growth, and others of this kind. So this is why uh, we treasure this opportunity of having this symposium today. You all know Andrea Boragno and his formidable leadership uh, at the head of this unique company, Alcantara. I'm sure he will help us, as is clearly stated in the program, to further explore in these two days the key issues and address a final call to action. At the end of our meetings, recommendations for leaders and stakeholders could well take the shape of a forceful manifesto. I wish you a pleasant stay and a very fruitful symposium. Thank you, Ambassador Vatani. Um, and with that, uh, you've already introduced uh, Andrea Borani, who is the CEO of Alcantara. Would you please kind, kindly step up and uh, give your opening remarks? Good morning, everybody. Thank you for participating. I am honored to open this symposium, which is the fifth symposium on sustainability organized by Venice International University and Alcantara. More specifically, this is the second year in a row where the subject that will be treated is global warming, climate change and decarbonization, which means that the subject is the same, the general subject is the same of last year uh, nevertheless, you will see that the focus uh, um, and perspective uh, will be quite different. Uh, let me start saying that a number of uh, uh, issues that have been pointed out last year uh, from several speakers have, become, uh, have been confirmed, and some of them have become more serious and more uh, er critical. For instance, last year, a number of speakers pointed out that, uh, sim very simply, we do not move fast enough, and that the perception of urgency still is missing in the vast public. Last year has been said that in the next 15 years, we must reduce emission of uh, at, at least 20%. As a matter of fact, in 2018, emission uh, increased for the first time in the last four years, which means that if we want to keep the same goal, we have to move even faster, we have to undertake even more drastic action, and uh, urgency so is getting more and more uh, critical and serious. And, um, I would like to add some additional consideration. I think that in this room, all of us uh, is aware of a number of evidences, is very well aware. We know that we are missing the two degrees uh, set by Paris, it's two or 1.5 or what it is. Uh, we know that, 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 we know very well that it's, that's missing a global common approach. We are very well aware that technology could play a very important role, and the same is true for finance, and the same is true for policymaker and citizen. And carbon pricing is uh, something that could give a very serious contribution to the acceleration of the decarbonization process. We know all this. This is achieved. Communication, then everybody is, agrees that communication is so important. This is an achievement. Uh, the, the, we know all this. And we know from our side very well that uh, uh, climate action is only one of the 17 uh, uh, global development goals. Nevertheless, we wanted to insist also this year uh, on this uh, subject because uh, uh, we uh, felt that uh, uh, was needed a special focus on how th why things are not happening and how to make them happen. 
And uh, so the goal of last year was to raise awareness, uh, to raise consciousness, to raise understanding. This year we wanted to add a, sp a special focus on how to generate engagement, how to generate action, how to become a kind of catalyst in order to generate action. And that's why we wanted to call this uh, symposium, call. the title is Climate How. And in the second day, the, oh, the second day will be dedicated to three breaking sessions where uh, will be debated uh, how to generate engagement with society at the different level of society, policy makers, citizen, and uh, corporation, and with a special uh, also mention also to finance. At this point, I would like to address uh, and express uh, my gratitude to a number of people who contributed uh, to the organization of this symposium. First of all, all the guest speakers which are participating. Uh, they, um, uh, most of them, they're very, very interested uh, in, uh, in this symposium and they showed a lot of motivation of uh, talking and discussing about how. Uh, I would like also to uh, address uh, uh, my, my, my gratitude to the press, the international press. We have here today uh, an important representation of the international press, uh, not only from Europe, but also from uh, Asia, US. When I say Asia, I mean China, Korea, Japan, and even from Russia. Uh, so we are very pleased of the attention that the international press is giving to our symposium. Very, very special thanks to Connect for Climate of the World Bank in the person of Giulia Braga. Uh, Giulia has been with us uh, since, uh, since the very beginning and she is uh, truly passionate about uh, uh, and enthusiastic about how to generate action and how to generate engagement. And then very, 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 and I should say very, some more times, special thanks to Georg Kerr. Also, Georg has been with us since the very beginning. He is a guest speaker uh, in the session of the um, uh, companies and finance, in the session of finance. Uh, but more than this, he has been with us since the very beginning. We had a lot of interaction and we had a lot of exchange of ideas and uh, also, we had a lot of discussion of which type of continuity to give to this type of activity. So maybe we'll talk about this uh, tomorrow. Uh, and he brought uh, to the table his experience and knowledge on the subject. So I think we have to thank him uh, in a very special way. Uh, and uh, at this point, I think we can move to the uh, projection of the three minutes movie which is representing uh, the symposium of last year, uh, prepared by the staff of Connect for Climate uh, of the World Bank. And this uh, will uh, warm us up um, before the different guest speaker take the microphone. So I think we can start with the projection of the movie. A lot of the social impacts of climate change are already there. We must look at the future of the Earth and make sure that it can continue for future generations. What is the mean of sustainability to survive? Uh, uh, today, still, there is uh, an important gap between what science says and what society receives, understands and knows. We believe that solutions already have been found, we must find how we can make them more formidable, better known, and somehow spread them all over the place. I'm actually becoming more and more optimistic about what we can do and how attractive it is, and more and more worried about whether we will do it. Climate diplomacy has so far not kept pace with the urgency of action. How can we overcome the dilemma of inaction in the face of overwhelming scientific evidence that there's an urgency to act? 
that urgency and scale is something that's very difficult for people to internalize. Fostering curiosity might be a way out of the sort of toxic science communication environment that we have when it comes to topics like climate change. Today I would like to talk about a roadmap for a great transformation towards sustainability. It's a very important message that the IA has of the need to work together amongst governments, the private sector. The growing reach of business through technology and innovations is increasingly shaping our lives and of course finance. The link between finance and sustainable corporate performance is one of the great promises ahead of us. And my hope is that thanks to occasions as this, two great movements that are underway. One is connected with the climate change and with the Paris Agenda and also the uh, social impact investment movement can integrate. We have started here in Venice something which looks like a step forward. So I would like to think about this symposium as a starting point for continuous action where Maybe the exchange of information is less formal, but more frequent. Ultimately, climate change connects us all again. We are truly interdependent. And therefore, ultimately, we will also need collective action together. Thank you very much. I think it's very clear from that summary video and from the opening uh, presentations that it is here, it is happening now. The urgency is like never before. We are at a starting point, but we really need to scale up, and it's a global challenge that we all need to come together. Um, and with that, we, we've got an exciting program today. Um, in, inspirational speakers, amazing thoughts, and, and, and discussions that will guide us on that path to a decarbonized and resilient future. Um, so I just want to remind the speakers that they've got 10 minutes, and then depending on, on, on how they stick to those 10 minutes, they might also get a, a few question opportunities afterwards. Um, so let us step straight into it, and our next session, I'd, I'd like to uh, welcome the speakers for the next session on how to decarbonize, what's happening now, and what's next on the agenda. And with that, I'd like to uh, welcome Daniel uh, Klingenfeld. Thank you so very much for joining us. <clears throat> Daniel is the head of uh, the director's staff at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. And he's going to be talking to us <clears throat> today about the IPCC special report on global warming um, of 1.5 degrees. What does it really mean to us? And I, I'd like to actually have you stand up here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador Vatani, Chairman Boranio. It's an honor and a great pleasure to be here with you once again. And uh, today I would like to set the scene by talking about the very recent IPCC special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius and really what it means for us. And in order to draw the link to what we've discussed and debated last year, I would actually like to show the concluding passages of an animation that I had brought to you last year. Some will realize it or recognize it. It shows you cumulative carbon emissions over time by means of which we've already warmed the planet by one degree Celsius up to this date. And if we were not successful in limiting uh, greenhouse gas emissions, we would, if the animation could please start. Thank you. We would, um, in a sense, move into a future where we would breach the two degrees Celsius guardrail already by before 2050 and move well towards three degrees or even above four degrees Celsius global warming by the end of this century. And you see this in this animation that looks a bit scary, it's supposed to do so, um, that um, it would really breach the limits of the Earth system. And this is actually what the recent IPCC report has made clear once again, it has really shown us the risks that we are facing, but more importantly, even so I would say, it has shown us pathways, how to limit warming to this ceiling of 1.5 degrees Celsius, which I should remind us is clearly part of the corridor specified in the Paris Agreement, 
where the world community agreed to limit global average temperature increase to well below two degrees Celsius and towards 1.5 degrees. And now for the first time we've got a synthesized scientific assessment that is bringing together all our knowledge on what it would mean to limit warming uh, to 1.5, but also about the differential impacts if we did not succeed, what it would mean to go um, towards two degrees Celsius, actually. And in fact, what it, what it entails is to have, by the end of the century, 10 centimeters at least of sea level uh, increase. That may not sound a lot, but the more important finding is that actually in that temperature range, the Greenland ice sheet could be tipped, meaning that in the long run, we would be looking at up to seven meters of additional sea level rise, which would be a completely different world to which we possibly cannot adapt. Um, it's also quite clear from the findings that um, limiting warming to 1.5 would lead to less weather extremes compared to higher warming levels, so meaning less extreme droughts and less extreme flooding. As we are here in the city of Venice, it's ob obviously a topic of survival of the city and of its cultural heritage. And um, another striking figure is that up to 50% of global population would be less, would be exposed to water shortages. And finally, up to several hundred million fewer people actually exposed to climate-related risk and susceptible to poverty already by 2050. So this is not just a talk about numbers, it is a talk about people. It's a talk about their future and in many cases also their survival. We have to take this seriously. Now, the report has identified five so-called reasons for concern, RFC, which in a sense um, are synthesized uh, categories of risk, looking at climate impacts and associated risks at different warming levels. I just want to pick out two of these reasons for concerns, the one to the very left, RFC1, which is looking at unique and threatened systems, ecosystems around the world, and you've got this color coding here in the bar charts and the temperature level of warming associated with it. And what you clearly see is it really goes into the pink zone at warming levels of around and above two degrees Celsius. So that means that many, many very, uh, vulnerable ecosystems around the world would be actually at risk of extinction. It's clearly showing that we must not go in this direction and again bolstering the value of that target range in terms of temperature of the Paris Agreement. But we also see that we've got this increasing risk zone between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius, once again underlining the benefits of, in a sense, um, landing the Earth system um, as, as low as possible on the warming scale as we can. Now if we move to the very right to RFC5, that's a look at, um, uh, at large-scale singular events the so-called tipping elements in the Earth system. And there also we see a phase transition if we move towards 2 degrees Celsius and above 2 degrees Celsius from a moderate to a high risk level. And so these tipping elements in the Earth system, just to recap for those who are not familiar with it, are large-scale processes in the Earth that if once tipped would transition into a different status that we could not alter as humans anymore. And we have these um, tipping elements in the cryosphere, so the ice world, circulation patterns, and the biosphere. And in a sense, a very new study that was also became part of the IPCC report has highlighted the interaction of these tipping elements. This is cutting edge new research that we didn't have a year ago. It's really looking at the, dynam the dynamics of different tipping elements influencing each other. And unfortunately, these dynamics point to positive feedback loops in a sense of additional warming. So even if we limited our carbon emissions to a certain level, nature would put something on top, so to say. So once again, a reason to be as ambitious as possible and to implement action as forcefully as we can. Now, what would this action look like? What are emission pathways and also system transitions consist consistent with 1.5 degree of warming? There, I'd like to bring to you a figure from this, from this 1.5 degree special report. This is a global emissions curve looking at a global emissions profile that would be consistent with limiting warming to that threshold. What you can see here indeed is a huge challenge. It means peaking global emissions more or less now. And we've heard from Chairman Boranio the bad news that last year we've seen another increase. And without additional policies, we will see further increases going forward. We have to tell the truth here as well. What we need though 
as a sudden decrease. It's actually going roughly something like 50% below 2010 levels globally and becoming carbon neutral globally by the middle of the century. And that means for us in our technologically more advanced countries moving faster. It means that also the targets at the European level are not consistent with 1.5 degrees Celsius. We need to do more if we were to avoid the risks that are looming large. Now you may say this is too much a call, it's too tough, but I also have some good news and I want to share this graph about annual average investments that is coming from this report over the next, um, uh, out to 2050 and you see there's a baseline, there's the national determined contributions and then we've got two degrees and 1.5 degree scenarios in terms of annual investments. And the good news from my perspective is compared from a baseline to um, this 1.5 scenario, it's 830 billion US dollars per year in addition. That's a large figure, but not really if you compare it to the size of the global economy. If we have experts from finance here. If they look at this as the global figure, it is quite manageable. And the increase in investment from 2 degrees to 1.5 is a mere 12%. That's what the modeling tells us. And where would this increase actually come from? Well, it would mostly be in the low carbon energy supply, but also demand sectors. Let's not forget energy efficiency as a major component in that story. And by an upscaling of a factor of roughly six uh, compared from 2050, we can meet this challenge. So that, that's the good news that I want to share with you. And we'll be talking about finance throughout the symposium. But let me, in a sense, conclude now with the two uh, last slides on um, the issue that climate change is not the only target we need to focus on. We need to look, this into, look at this into the context or in the context of sustainable development and efforts to eradicate poverty. And in effect, it has already been alluded to by Chairman Boranio in his introduction, it, this is, there's, there are close links to the sustainable development goals that set out pathways for uh, 2030. And indeed, what we need to look at is at a mix of measures that is conducive towards realizing multiple goals within these SDGs. There are trade-offs and the IPCC report has identified them. Please also have a look at it. It's just a 30 pages summary beyond what I can say in a few minutes. I really recommend for all those who have not really accessed it to do this, maybe also after my hopefully motivating speech to look at this. And there you can see positive trade-offs where one, achieving one goal is actually helping achieve another goal, but we also have negative uh, trade-offs, which we also need to be aware of. For example, in the area of bioenergy that may be in competition with land use and global nutrition. So what we need is a very thoughtful, very careful mix of measures in order to make progress on multiple fronts. How can this progress be made? Who are the actors? Yes, of course we need international cooperation, we need global agreements, but it's us here in this room and beyond where actually the locus of action lies. It is cities, it is companies, it is academia. It is really us that innovate, that drive new solutions, that prove new concepts which make it easier for policymakers then to establish um, climate policies that really help us. Carbon pricing was mentioned, it really remains one of the core components in a global strategy. But it is really us who need to take action in order to enable that condition. So my last point is that we, we need to move away from simply mitigation pathways to sustainable development pathways. And there the 2030 targets are just one mark on our pathway towards a world, hopefully in 2050, where we achieve social and economic sustainability within a stable earth system. And there we need to respect planetary boundaries such as climate, but also obviously um, the uh, global land use sector. We need to look at fresh water and other boundaries. But if we act together, we can make it. And this is the hopeful message I want to deliver. We've got pathways and we need to start acting. We need to accelerate. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish us a successful symposium. Um, thank you. We've got time for one or two burning questions if uh, anybody would like to ask a question. I'm available in the breaks as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Daniel. That was very clear that, you know, the transition is possible. Um, no, I think back to your seat. Thank you. Um, and with that, I'd, I'd actually like to move the program right along and ask uh, Bjorn Haugland uh, if Bjorn could come and join us up here. Uh, Bjorn is the Executive Vice President and Chief Sustainability Officer for DNV, uh, 
GL Group. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And we look forward to your presentation. Thank you for uh, invitation and introduction. Dear chairs, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be here. Um, and let me very shortly uh, give you a, a brief update on what we call the NSC transition from DNV GL. And for those not familiar with us, we are a 150 years plus company doing risk management within different industries. We are today in 107 countries working with shipping, oil and gas, renewable energy, food, healthcare, and the core is risk management. And um, we are fully 100% owned by a foundation. So within the area of energy, we have seen many predictions. Um, we believe that as an independent company, we can give you, at least based on our research, uh, a future which we believe will happen. That means we are not presenting a scenario. We are presenting the most likely future. We are using system dynamics uh, as a methodology to predict. Uh, we see big change in the energy transition going forward. This is the overall picture. If you see over the last 40 years, we have been about 80% fossil and 20% renewable. That ratio has been kind of constant over the last 40 years. If you look forward to 2050, we will see we move to a 50-50 uh, ratio between the re renewable and, and fossil. That is a dramatic shift. I can already now see it is not enough, just to, to give that. I will come back to the cl climate implication. But it is a dramatic shift going on. Uh, the three ma majority sectors is uh, obviously transport building and, and manufacturing. And you see all of these sectors uh, are basically uh, going constant. Um, and that is our point, that we are in 2030 reaching a point where the primary energy is peaking. And then obviously you will see a lot of uh, transformation within the sectors. And let me give you a few points from the transportation sector. Um, uh, we already see what is going on in some countries in the world. Uh, I'm coming from Norway and uh, Norway have the highest density of electric cars. And we think that will continue to happen in many countries going forward. So this is our prediction on uptake on electric or uh, zero emission cars. So the curve in the middle says that in 2032, about 50% of all new cars sold will be electric. And th then some regions will move faster than others. And you see Europe is, is leading this transformation. In Norway today, more than 50% of all new cars is sold is, is electric. Um, and we work with all of the big manufacturers and, and we see they are all moving onto this pathway. What is not so common uh, known is what is happening in, in, the, in the area of buses and, and cargo trucks. And it's going slower, but we also see a significant uptake and, or we forecast a significant uptake in that sector uh, going forward. And you see the leading regions are Europe and China. So what has this with, with energy? It's, it's, it's definitely driving energy efficiency a great uh, time. So, so you, you, you see an electric bus is about three times, maybe four times more efficient than um, the, the, the combustion uh, engine. And I took this um, um, example from China. So anybody ho know how many electric buses there are in China? Any guesses? Yes? 400,000. Shenzhen alone has, um, has more than 16,000 
electric buses. So every week, thousands of new electric buses is put into the infrastructure in, in China. And over time, you know, this will, will, will evolve uh, into to Europe and, and US as well. So it is a lot of, of good things going on. Um, our society will be more electrified. So the share of electrification today is about 20%. And our prediction is that it will move to 50% in 2050. And of course, the combination of renewable energy, more electricity, drive energy efficiency. And that is the key enabler for my argument that we are reaching this peak energy era in 2030. So the energy efficiency is greater than the GDP and economic growth. And most of the new electricity is coming from solar and wind. Actually, our prediction tells that 70% of the new electricity will come from wind and solar. And today, when we produce electricity from, from coal, it's about maybe 30% efficient, maybe 35% efficient, when we produce electricity from solar and wind, it is close to 100% efficient. So energy efficiency is really what is, again, causing this peak, energy, peak demand uh, uh, energy future, which we predict. So that's why we are in the area of, of a different growth pattern going forward. The energy efficiency will outface the global um, uh, economic growth. We will still have a growth, but more and more economies are moving into a service economy. So you see the growth factor and the growth rate will come down. China will come down and most of the mature economies will come down, but it will still be uh, a growth. Our prediction on population is about 9 billion people in, in 250. It's lower than the UN predictions, uh, partly because we account for uh, more urbanization and more education of, of, uh, of women. So then we take down the, the population. And then you see this split between economic growth and, and, and energy, which has kind of followed uh, up to to, to, to this area, but we now see it split. And we also see that the energy-related emissions are coming uh, down. So this is the broad view of our prediction. Taking the whole you know, perspective back to climate, even though it might seem like an optimistic uh, prediction, we are not even close to reach the 2 degree or the 1.5 degree carbon budget. So the 2 degree budget will be, you know, exceeded in, in, in 2040. So, so I've given you a, a pretty kind of optimistic uh, prediction, but still we are far from reaching the carbon budget. And actually we are pointing to a 2.6 uh, future. So that means, uh, you know, based on what we see, we did need to develop much faster on cleaner energy. We need to develop technologies for carbon capture and storage. And we need to drive even more focus on energy efficiency going forward. And then finally, I would just say that, you know, that this was a kind of a, a, a outlook on and prediction on energy. Uh, yesterday, we launched a new report in, in Oslo, uh, together with the UN Global Compact. It's called the Global Opportunity Explorer. It's basically an initiative to look at bottom-up solutions. So, um, addressing all the 17 SDGs. So, if you enter the globalexplorer.org, uh, glo go you will find more than 1,000 solutions. And they are all organized after the SDGs. And I think 
this is really what we should encourage all of us, because this is also a bottom-up uh, revolution. It is a solution revolution. It's so much going on now out in, in this world. So we should kind of encourage that to happen, and we should make platform to share all the good examples. And I'm glad to see a lot of good examples, and I hope also during the two days here that we can share good examples that we all can bring further and be inspired of. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Swedrup. Um, if we have any questions, I'd, I'd uh, encourage you to ask that now. There's a mic in the back. Um, we've got a question up front. Hi, everybody. My name is Fritz Leach, and I have one question. You said that we need a bottom-up approach. Could you please make this a little bit more pre precise, what you mean by a bottom-up approach? Yeah, I, I, I just think that you know, big corporations li like us and others uh, could help to facilitate, to get visibility to all the solutions which are out there. And I see also for our own kind of innovation agenda, we take a lot of inspiration these days of, how to say, stealing ideas of what is going on in order to get scale of it. So I think we should just, uh, in, in this digital world, uh, all of us see how we can, can share the good examples and help them to scale. You said could, but how will they do it, and why will they do it? Well, I, I, think, uh, I think they will scale if they get attention. And uh, I mean, it's a lot of barrier to grow, grow solutions. Uh, it's financial barriers, it's political barriers, and so on and so forth. But I think the power of good ideas are there, and I think all in the room could, uh, could support that, that process to happen. And I just showed you one platform, and it is more platforms out there which is kind of supporting that going forward. I, I'm going to have to ask the next person to ask their question briefly, and also for a very brief answer if possible. Thank you very much. Um, so the microphone is coming forward. Thanks, I just had a focused technical question. I think you said that solar energy, or solar power perhaps, is 100% efficient, and I just didn't, I wondered what you meant. I, I said that producing um, electricity from solar energy is close to 100% efficient. It, through, through what means? That you don't lose uh, energy due to kind of transmission when you go from solar to, to but electricity. But PV panels are w well below 100% efficiency. Yeah, it's not 100% from the solar to the, to the electricity, but what you kind of, you know, capture on the PV, you don't have very much kind of... Uh, oh, transmission losses yes, you're talking yes, about. Oh, yeah. right. okay, thank you. I, I think we can continue that in, in the break. Thank you so very much for thank your you. presentation. Um, and, and next up, we've got uh, Yin Bo. Um, if Yin Bo could come and join me up, up uh, on stage here. Y uh, Mr. Bo is the uh, Deputy Director of the Europe Office, Global Energy Interconnection Development and Cooperation Organization. Sorry? I think oh, you was not reaching my apologies. I, I got the last uh, program. Um, Timothy, if you could come and join us up, up on top here. <laughs> Timothy is uh, with Thomson Reuters. I hope you were expecting me. I, I, <laughs> so it's, 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 it's a great honor to be here on behalf of Reuters, so thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, you know, visiting uh, Venice, I think, is a reminder of just how much beauty we are capable of creating. And I think we should <laughs> keep that in mind uh, today and over the next few days as we think about what we can do together as a humanity. I chose this image from Reuters to begin my talk because if there's one thing I'd like you to remember, it's perhaps this image. This is, of course, a beautiful shot of a gondola, but there is no pilot. And what we found in our research, which I'm going to talk about, of the largest 250 global emitters in the world, these are publicly traded companies, responsible for a third, a third 
of annual anthropogenic emissions. The 250 CEOs from these firms could fit in this room. In many of those C-suites, there is no pilot on climate. There is no pilot. In fact, some of them might even point to the snow and suggest that the, the climate is actually cooling somehow. And I'd even suggest further that the snow rate is increasing, so it's more and more difficult to determine if the gondolas next to this one have a pilot or not. So I'm going to paint a little bit of a bleak picture with some signs of hope, but I, I wanted you to try to keep this image in mind as we go through the presentation. So in a couple of weeks, we're going to re release a report on the largest 250 emitters, as I mentioned a minute ago. And this is a bit of the context for how we think about the business opportunity for these massive carbon intensive uh, business models. Essentially what we're looking at is over the next 10 to 15 years, a combination of incredible innovation that's driving eco-efficiencies, or in other words, the ability of these business models to create profit without at the same time damaging the environment. Alongside that, we have the ongoing onslaught of regulatory change, which will drive increasing disclosure, as well as performance requirements around that disclosure. And then on top of all of that, we have the ongoing increase in the direct costs of climate disruption. These are severe climate events that we're seeing more and more of. And so what does this mean for these massive carbon intensive business models? It means that they are looking at what we call the sustainability premium zone. So to the question earlier of how do you incent massive businesses like this to change. It's really in part about the opportunity. And the idea of the sustainability premium zone is that the earlier you start to make that change in your business model, the more of that premium you can capture over time and the more you can start to outpace your competitors. And it is a race um, in, in this race towards 2030 and beyond in a carbon constrained world. So that's the context that we take to the research on carbon intensive business models. Now it's very interesting. What we found is that when you start to look at how firms actually transform their business models in the data, there is a very predictable pattern. And it, and it works like this. I'm just going to take you through this really quickly. First of all, what firms do is they come out with a policy. And they say, we care a ton about climate change. And they put a whole bunch of UN Sustainable Development Goals icons on their report. And they say, we're going to really get on it. Most of them don't, but they almost all have a policy. And then the next step is they start to do some initial greenhouse gas reporting. So they start sort of counting up what they're already sort of counting in different parts of their business. And they report that out as part of their emissions. After that, they start to set emissions targets. We're going to project out next year, maybe the year after that, how much we're going to go down. And after that, an incredibly important step, dominant scope reporting. This is the a part of the, the business's emissions that really matter. Okay, so for the G250 or these largest 250 emitters, this is what we call use of product. Scope three. It's what happens after their product hits the marketplace and is actually used in the market. A barrel of oil, an airplane, a car. This is the step in reporting that roughly 50% or so of the G250 have achieved and are now telling the world about their performance. After that, we get to complete reporting. They're really good at it now, They're reporting everything. And then finally, science-based targets. By the way, this is about a 10-year process for most business models. Science-based targets. So this is when they're actually telling us how they're going to decarbonize going into the next 10, 15, 20 years. This is absolutely crucial. If these businesses aren't telling us how they're going to do this, we don't have a plan because we can't get to 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees without many more of them on board. So excuse the sort of the lack of clarity in this image, but I wanted to show you the, the, the pattern from 2011 to 2017. We don't have data yet from 2018. And you can see here the sort of steady march upward in transparency with this big tall blue bar being policy, lots of policy out there. Uh, the next critical step down is that uh, light blue bar and, and sort of light green bar where you start to get into full dominant emissions reporting. And then finally, finally at the very bottom there, we see, you know, 27 of the G250 are actually telling us how they plan to decarbonize their business model over the next 20, 30 years. 
And here they are. These folks, trying to stay on the positive side of things, these are the firms that are doing it. These are, oops, sorry. These are the firms that are actually telling us with science-based targets to reach the end of their pathway. Uh, these are the top 20 uh, in the G250. Number four, Cummins, that means it's the, the number four highest emitter globally in this G250 category. And if you look at this list of businesses, you know, what, what you see here is a variety of different business models. Capital goods, heavy industry, energy. Uh, you know, these, these are firms that across the economic spectrum have come up with pathways that they are public about on how they are gonna preserve a habitable planet for all of us. So this can be done, and there are examples of how this can be done. And furthermore, we took a look in the report at you know, what are some of the, uh, the benefits that accrue to firms that are both being transparent and are decarbonizing. So first on the transparency side of things, we divided the G250 into low transparency emitters, medium transparency emitters, and high transparency emitters, again, using the same framework I described earlier. And it turns out that if you look at total shareholder return over this period from 2011 to 2017, you know, you, you do see a roughly 3% return premium just for transparency alone, just for transparency alone. And then if you dig deeper and you look at the companies where we had enough data over the most recent three-year period to look at, you know, the question of does decarbonization in those business models penalize the firm? Does that capital intensive investment penalize the firm? Or is there maybe even potentially a benefit? What we see is that for those that are carbonizing over that same 2000, not the same period, but from 2015 to 17, we see about an 11 and a half percent return. For the decarbonizers, the ones that are really future-proofing their businesses, double that. So what does this suggest? This suggests that at the very least, there's not a penalty. There's not a penalty for investment in decarbonization and you know may very well represent a premium and I, I would expect to see looking at many other data points on this topic that this business case for decarbonization will continue to improve. So last but not least uh, this is the slide uh, that shows you the top 25 of the G250 okay over on the right is what we call their transparency bar. The bigger the bar, the more transparent they are. The, more, the further down the pathway they have come towards being future-proof for a carbon-constrained world. These 25 businesses represent approximately 20%, 20% of global anthropogenic emissions. If you look at the whole G250, one in five, one in five have science-based targets. One in five are telling us how they're gonna help us all live in a two-degree world. So this is kind of a disturbing picture once you start to dig into the data, but I think it's important to be you know, really lucid on the challenge that we have ahead um, and how we might convince many more of these businesses uh, that it's in their own best interest uh, to begin their journey towards transparency and decarbonization. Thank you very much. If we could open it up for any questions for Mr. Nixon. Um, otherwise, I believe there's also a question for Daniel at the very back. So maybe we could just take that one quickly. This was just a short question to Daniel. Uh, your your boss, uh, Professor Schellenhuber, was in the advisory team of uh, Chancellor Merkel for a long time. And you said you, we need change of the policy makers. So why hasn't Germany taken over a leading role being supported, being, being informed by Professor Schellenhuber? Why do we have to wait that long, even we know all the facts and figures since years? Could be a, a long, a long answer to this to this question. Um, I don't, I don't see it that much black and white. I mean, let me just because you mentioned that name, Professor John Schellenhuber. Um, I served as a Sherpa now on the Coal Commission. That was a civil society initiative, but set up by the German government 
to debate and ultimately trying to find a consensus uh, for an exit of using coal in power generation in Germany. So not just um, more or less uh, stopping um, um, hard coal mining, which has happened last year, but also stopping lignite mining and also stopping the use of imported coal. So this is something that the government took up and mandated a commission um, staffed by business representatives, by trade unions, by environmental groups, by science, Potsdam Institute, uh, to debate this. And we came actually to a consensus uh, just 10 days ago. Um, it was a hard-won consensus, some, one that, of course, no one is entirely happy with, and let's see whether um, there may still be policy changes down the road, but at least we agreed at the very latest to phase out coal in Germany by 2038, possibly before that. And that is already another step moving the country in, in a direction of low carbon to zero carbon. So I don't, I don't want to be, I don't, I, I'm not so, um, so pessimistic, I don't fully share your view that um, nothing has happened or uh, we're not moving, um, but indeed, I mean, my talk showed that we need this, this acceleration. And, and there, um, I also see positive signs. I mean, this is one element. I see, in a sense, a new awareness, uh, also better information base, uh, we have got entrepreneurs here. The costs are coming down for alternative technologies. So I would actually almost place a bet on the years to come that we would see much more acceleration driven not fully but only by policies, but that then policies can pick that up. So I see this exchange. That's also bottom-up strategy, by the way, this exchange of initiative, of uh, entrepreneurial risk as well, but then also reward and policy, in a sense, coming on board. So let's, let's tangle. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, we still have time for another question for uh, Mr. Nixon. There's a question here in the middle. Let's just wait for the microphone. Hi, Colin Price. Um, this is a question for all the speakers, but uh, all speakers have been dealing with the developed world. But what about the future of the developing world when Africa and India and countries like this are going to want to get electricity and use power, and does this, is this included in these estimates for the future? So thank you for asking that question. Uh, m most of um, the companies that uh, I was talking about as sort of being at the very beginning of that, that transparency journey uh, are actually uh, carbonizing companies, companies becoming more carbon intensive or adding to their aggregate carbon footprint in the developing world. Uh, and why are they doing that? They're doing that because they are meeting the demand for energy. Uh, and they're satisfying the regulatory requirements that, that are on them. And they're competing in a marketplace where their competitors are doing the same thing. So I think, you know, as we think about the developing world opportunity here, it is the opportunity, at least with respect to, you know, these large carbon intensive business models which are steadily increasing their carbon intensity. Thank you. Um, okay, just briefly, uh, half a minute. Half a minute. Um, you mentioned India. Who asked the question, by the way? You. Um, uh, from my experience, having been, uh, been back just a few months ago and then my first experience a few years ago, a lot has changed in the internal discourse. And that's also because the economic opportunities are much bigger. Five years ago, no one wanted to talk about maybe reducing coal power usage in India. There were big expansion plans. Now they're seeing that the, 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 the economic benefits of using photovoltaics have completely changed. And also when we look at energy efficiency, the rollout of LED has happened so much faster than anyone expected five years ago. So I talked to energy analysts in India and they, they, they told me that the policy landscape is also changing because even without, let's say, international assistance, which is still important, I don't want to discount this, but even without massive transfers from richer countries, there are now a, there's now a different economic situation that should give us grounds for hope that the transformation there will, be, will pick up more speed than before just a couple of years ago. Great, thank you very much. And we've got the discussion going on tomorrow, so I'd like you to also save these questions for tomorrow. Thank you so very much for your presentation, Mr. Nixon. So we've really seen what's happening now, where we need to go, what corporations are doing in the broad scale. Um, so we'd like to dive a little bit deeper into the, how corporations can ramp up their climate actions. And with that, I'd like to invite Heidi uh, Husko to come and join us up here. Um, Heidi is a 
Senior Manager for Environment and Climate Change at the United Nations Global Compact. Thank you for joining us. Please take the stage. Thank you so much uh, for uh, welcoming to, uh, to share some of the experiences from, uh, from the UN Global Compact on how we see that uh, companies have been engaging on uh, climate action over the past uh, few years and how that has been evolving. And uh, uh, I also wanted to say, since we've uh, been talking a little bit about science-based targets, that's also one of the initiatives that we run together in a great partnership with uh, CDP and WWF and WRI, uh, which I am in the steering committee of as well. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna try to, to make some references to the Science-Based Targets Initiative as well. Um, and um, uh, it is great to see uh, many familiar faces here today and also some uh, new faces and I hope that we will have a great uh, Great discussion over uh, over the next uh, days. Um, I wanted to uh, to start uh, with going back to what was being presented first: uh, the urgency to go towards 1.5, and uh, we really have less than 12 years to fundamentally change our economic systems. And it really is the biggest challenge of our lifetime, as the UN Secretary General himself uh, puts it as well. And uh, I brought into this slide also the picture of the signing ceremony of the Paris Agreement. Because when the Paris Agreement was decided upon, uh, we didn't know what we know now. And uh, that really puts us in a new situation. Uh, the Paris Agreement itself uh, puts the world uh, on a track of two degrees, well below two degrees, towards 1.5. Now we know better. Now we know that we need to go towards 1.5. And, uh, and uh, this is also uh, um, what, we, what we from the Global Compact side really want to push companies to, to do as well. And understanding that urgency, at the UN Global Compact, we are now asking our companies, we have over 9,500 companies, uh, to make a public commitment that they are supporting a 1.5 degree pathway towards net zero future. Uh, so uh, we really uh, need to ramp up ambition and also do this urgency. Uh, with urgency and um, my science-based targets initiative colleagues and especially the comms team might not like me mentioning this now <laughs> because uh, we're coming out with, a, with an announcement in a, in a few weeks time uh, um, but I wanted to let you know already that the science-based targets initiative uh, we will uh, um, ramp up uh, the ambition of the initiative we are a science-based targets initiative which means that uh, we are looking to latest climate science. And um, as was mentioned in the, in the previous speech, um, uh, science-based targets are when companies are aligning with a well below two degree pathway. Now we will be looking to companies actually uh, committing to 1.5 and also validating targets aligned with, uh, with 1.5. But there is much to be done here because many of these uh, methodologies are not developed yet. You know, this is uh, brand new science, so there's a lot to be done to be able to, to get this uh, accurate. But uh, just we, we learn as we go and it's better to, uh, to really have a, a high standard on, uh, on where we need to aim for. And in the Science-Based Targets Initiative, we have 515 companies committed uh, from various sectors from uh, all around the world. And uh, 168 of those are validated targets. We already know now that there's uh, a good portion of those targets that are already aligning with 1.5. Um, so uh, um, I think its science-based targets initiative uh, is a good example of how we are disrupting business as usual. Uh, companies are really seeing, and the leading companies are seeing that this is, uh, this is the future, and the climate change really push, push, put a new pressure on, uh, on companies. And it is the single most uh, biggest market disruptor as well of, uh, of the future. And we see that in a way because companies are signing up to various um, uh, 
climate uh, change commitments. Uh, for instance, one-fifth of global Fortune 500 have committed to science-based targets. The new climate economy report that came out last year, uh, it predicts that all Fortune 500 will have a science-based target by 2020. Um, and, um, and this is really a way also of uh, what we see that uh, ESG, in, uh, this is the, the question that investors and ESG are really looking for as well on, on how companies are preparing uh, uh, for climate. And, uh, and uh, over 400 investors representing 32 trillion call for a carbon price between 38 and $100 by 2030. So that's also another example of, uh, you know, the preparations that need to happen uh, within companies and how this is disrupting the way uh, uh, companies have been run and how climate change really is becoming more into the core of uh, even the board decisions that are being made. Um, um, talking about board decision and leadership, uh, I think we've all been really inspired uh, by uh, the Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg. Uh, she's, uh, she's been an amazing voice of reason uh, at the COP in Katowice as well as in Davos. And I think this uh, is something that we should really uh, listen to. And um, I mean, uh, here uh, she said in Davos, uh, in case you missed this, she said, we must change almost everything in our current societies. The bigger your footprint, the bigger your moral duty. The bigger your platform, the bigger your responsibility. And then she said, I want you to act as you would be in a crisis. I want you to act as if your house is on fire, because it is. And it is amazing, she's 16 years old, in two years time, she'll be able to vote. Uh, she brings together a large group of young people around Europe that are now also um, uh, st school striking on Fridays in front of the parliaments. And, uh, and these young people, you know, will be part of also changing uh, the system. So uh, for us, we have to prepare for, for what is coming because we have uh, great generations that are, that are taking the leadership in the absence of, of uh, adults taking that leadership. Uh, based on, uh, on the experience at the, at the Global Compact, we've been looking at, you know, what, what do companies do? Uh, what is kind of the maturity uh, of, uh, of climate action? And uh, here we've tried to put this in a chart showing climate ap ap uh, ambition intensity as well as policy behavior. Um, so uh, the idea and the, um, what we saw also in the lead up to the Paris Agreement was that there was a, a lot of great coalitions that were started. Uh, we launched, for instance, the carbon pricing leadership criteria at the UN Global Compact, the science-based targets, uh, RE100, EV100. There's a lot of uh, really great commitment areas that companies are signing up to. And this sends a really strong signal to policymakers because we know that the, uh, the national determined contributions that countries are supporting the Paris Agreement with do not align with the Paris Agreement. But we also know at the same time that companies are making a lot of public commitments on the global level uh, that will help bridge that gap. But that gap between what companies are doing, what investors are doing, what governments are doing are really blur and we don't know how it all fits into the bigger picture. And what we're trying to uh, focus on here is, um, is how those uh, global commitments can actually need to spark local implementation and most of all, the policy engagement that needs to happen between these companies who have taken public commitments and speak to the policymakers in their countries so that countries also understand that there's a lot of business with huge supply chains or, or uh, you know, uh, huge potential invest investing uh, 
uh, that need that where the policymakers need to know the the market opportunities at the, uh, of the future. So basically, we are saying it is not enough if you've done a science-based target. It is not enough if you have a carbon price. You also need to actively, responsibly engage in policy discussions. And ultimately, there'll be the benefits of uh, enhanced uh, national determined contributions, and we'll see, you know, uh, the sustainable markets grow, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, a final uh, slide before I end. I wanted to show you also a, uh, a report uh, that uh, we launched together with World Resources Institute and Women Business uh, just ahead of COP last year. And this uh, publication looks at that interface between uh, uh, global uh, commitments from companies as well as uh, what is needed from the government policy side and how that creates this ambition loop of how you know a, uh, a corporate engagement on the other on the on the one side can uh, influence policies in uh, certain sectors on the other hand and how you know we get into the point in the end of of enhanced policies so I really recommend uh, to to have a look at uh, at that report as well and uh, happy to talk more about this over uh, the next two days thank you so much thank you Heidi we've got time for a quick question um, what I thought was really exciting is that um, as the science becomes clearer and the policies are uh, increasingly known, companies are really stepping up and uh, engaging in these options like science-based targets and uh, putting a price on carbon. So any questions, quickly? So just a quick sort of follow-up from these two presentations. Mm. So um, fantastic initiative, obviously very important, but how do we encourage these more you know, carbon-intensive businesses to begin to lead more quickly? Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a very good question, and I think it's great to also know we have some, some speakers from the industry as well here today. Uh, I, think, I think the question here is about energy transition as a, as a whole, and how uh, the survival of the, the sector in the future as well. Um, and um, um, we've been, the way we've been working at the Global Compact is that we try to to uh, um, have these commitment areas where we push companies to do a little bit more than what they otherwise would have done. Uh, just as an example, uh, carbon pricing, for instance, we knew in 2014 that many companies were setting an internal price, price on carbon, and we also knew that some companies were publicly advocating for a price on carbon. But we didn't, well, we didn't see that those companies who were preparing for a price on, price on carbon necessarily asked for that from their policy makers. So I, th I think the, qu the thing is here that you have to have consistency in uh, your own uh, future um, perceptions of the company or where you want to go and also that you advocate for that and that you're transparent as, as your presentation. That. Thank you so very much, Heidi. Thank you. Um, and yes, we do have companies here today with us. So uh, next up, thank you. I would like to, <laughs> as, as companies can step up to really become climate leaders in their own right, I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Bjorn uh, Svendorp to come up and uh, talk to us about what Equino is doing. So Bjorn is the Senior Vice President for Su sustainable, Sustainability at Equino. Please take the stage. Um, thanks, and uh, thank you, Andrea, for having us, uh, having me here for, um, and be able to talk to such a great audience. And I really agreed with what was said about the beauty of Venice. So thank you again, again for being able. What a fantastic start of the day to ride here with the boat. OK, so um, uh, what I wanted to share with you is some um, ideas on how we work to address this fundamental issue of, of carbon. So, um, how do I move this forward? Yeah. So for those who, do, who don't know Equinor, we used to be called Statoil. Uh, and we provide energy to around 175 million people every day. And I confess, we <laughs> produce also carbon. Uh, so um, what I'm gonna share with you, and when I pull this together, I said, you know, 
Um, I'm going to share with you how we, what's our plan to help decarbonize the oil and gas industry and also make a contribution. But when I started, I, I, I just wanted to make this a bit personal. So I'm an identical twin. So this is me and my twin brother running. You know, I still haven't figured out who's who. Uh, but it says 48 and 49. And um, so, uh, but uh, anyway, I learned a lot since then. So at the time, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere was 331. And we know that we need to stay that below 450. And the February number isn't out yet, but I just checked, you know, the beautiful city of Venice. So it's 412 now. So in this uh, lifetime, my lifetime, we've gone from 331 to 412. And then in the summer, I gave this speech to Leo and his master students at uh, Notre Dame University. And the number then was 402. So it's amazing how quickly the the CO2 concentration is going up. So this is real. And, and where's all this CO2 coming from? And, and we know that because um, you can measure it with the high level of detail. It, most of it is coming from the energy systems. And the energy system is basically fossil fuels. It's two thirds, 81%. And it was the same 30 years ago at the uh, Sustainable uh, uh, Summit. Very sticky number, 81%. It's a fundamental challenge that citizens and businesses and governments need to get rid of kind of the, the emitting part of the fossil fuels. Uh, so we're in a period of uh, energy. Trans if you're going to solve the climate challenge, <clears throat> we need to solve the energy challenge, basically. It's that easy. So what kind of trajectory could we see? We don't know that. It will depend on plenty of things. How many people will there be on the planet? The ability to citizens to choose differently. Technology, behavior, costs, climate change, these disruptive changes. We don't know. But for a business like us, we have a big imp an important role in, in this, both on the lower side. Make sure that while we're still using fossil fuels, we produce the right ones and use it as efficiently as possible. And the other one, capture the business opportunities for a big growth in renewables. So that's our plan. And of course, the first big thing is, uh, as uh, Mr. Klingenfeld said, try to get rid of coal as quickly as possible. Very, very important. Our plan is threefold. Reduce our own emissions. Make sure that we produce, use as little energy as possible while providing energy. Secondly, grow in renewables. Thirdly, embed climate and into all our decision making. So I'll give you a couple of examples of how could even the oil and gas industry contribute to decarbonization. Around five, potentially up to 10%, because they're lacking data of all world, world total emissions is coming from the oil and gas industry's own activities. So making sure that we emit as little when you produce energy is very, very important. So for us, like you, when you're driving a car, how much gasoline you use per mile is very, very important. For us, how much CO2 do you emit per barrel of oil you produce? We are now at nine. We would like to go to eight. We'll average is 17. The industry can improve on this. Getting rid of flaring is a very, very important part of this journey. And it also opens up for amazing technology developments. This is our biggest new development. We're going to run it 100% on renewables. Shifting from pure oil to natural gas is another important step that we can do. We are now nearly up to 50%. Other companies are also you know, moving that. But then you need to make sure you have the methane emissions under control. So eliminating methane emissions, fundamentally important. So we watched that with a close eye, and I think we have made a good job, but also doing a lot of kind of science to really understand those emissions and to detect and stop it. To make sure that the climate benefits of natural gas is fully intact compared to coal. And then, of course, even outside our fence, I think we have a big 
responsibility and can do influence. We do a lot of these ships. So we have around 100 super tankers sailing the world and around 70 of these supply vessels. Last summer, when we put out a charter, we asked all the boats to say, we would like you to run your engines part on hybrid battery technologies. So we are lifting in a new type of shipping vessels that allows them to, to decarbonize shipping. A really interesting journey. And then, of course, longer term, bigger schemes, carbon capture and storage, and potentially hydrogen, could be either through renewables or through natural gas, provide clean energy in, at scale through combination of carbon capture and storage and hydrogen. We're working with projects on that. I'm quite optimistic on it, but we need a carbon price to make this fly. This is very important. And then, of course, on our side, um, gradually shifting more of our capital towards uh, renewables. Uh, we are now doing uh, around 5% of our capital in renewables. That is 5% out of $10 billion. So it's still a bunch of money. And we said we're going to quadruple that over the coming years. So out of the, was it 800 billion you said was needed in, Equinor is going to do two of those. Okay. So, so, so uh, yeah, it is, uh, it's uh, possible to, to grow in that. We are now the world's largest, among the world's largest offshore oil and gas companies. We are particularly looking at offshore wind to use our competence and skills, developing projects in the UK, Germany, in the US, uh, and are really optimistic about this technology, and uh, we'll see uh, how far it can take us. We are on this journey together with many others. So when you say that, we are probably on your list of 250, right? Huh? You're a leader. Okay. But, but still, I think, I'm sorry, but I think your list is a bit too simplistic because um, this is a journey that you need to do together with both producers of energy and consumers of energy. So we are on that list because we provide a lot of people with energy. So I think we need to find a way of how do we create a more responsibly behaved by governments to incentivize shifts but also consumers need, to, or citizens need to take responsibility for their own emissions and how they choose to travel or fly or eat or live their lives. And then of course businesses can help to deliver technology and innovate to make that transition happen faster. So <clears throat> I think we need dialogue. I think we need <clears throat> uh, an attempt to seek solutions in this space and then of course, we have a particular role to provide technology in this big transition. So I look forward to discussing that further with you. Thanks. Um, if, if I may, thank you very much. We've got time for a question. And if, if I may, I've, I've always wanted to ask the uh, fossil fuel industry, what's your plan around calm neutral fuels? So calm neutral biofuels, calm neutral synthetic fuels where you pull the CO2 out of the atmosphere? Okay, so uh, we are, of course, blending a lot. Um, we are blending in biofuels and other things into the, uh, the um, refined products. Uh, we can do more. You can uh, spike it with hydrogen, and you can produce that hydrogen either through natural gas and carbon capture to have a zero emission one, or you can do, uh, produce it on renewables. So it's basically a cost issue and a timing and technology issue. But you could foresee nearly zero emissions on, on liquids, as we call it, but it's, uh, it's uh, way out when it comes to being cost competitive. Great, and uh, open for questions? We've got one here. Uh, okay, um, I noticed that you just mentioned CCS, and uh, uh, what do you think about the future of this technology in uh, onshore oil field? Thank you. Okay, so carbon capture and storage. We have been doing that for 20 years. So each year we're capturing around a million tons, storing it permanently into geological safe reservoirs, proven technology to say that we, we understand that technology. We can say it's a safe place to deposit it. Uh, there's no way you need to do that offshore. You could do it in 
onshore places as well. Of course, uh, um, uh, yeah, there are some particular concerns you need to take. I think carbon capture, uh, IPCC points to it's uh, very much a needed technology. Uh, and it, it was hard to see on uh, Professor Klingenfeld's line here, but when you saw that outlook on emissions, a lot of it needs to go into the negative terrain, negative emissions. And then, of course, carbon capture storage is just essential technology. So, uh, so uh, we, I think we have little time to develop that and accelerate the development of that. Fantastic. We've got one last question for you. Yes, thank you. Um, I would like to understand the one graph that you showed where you started with the usage of 100% fossil energy. Can you remember? Yeah, one yeah. of the first slides. Why you start with 100% fossils? Because if you go back in history, um, we are not using fossil fuels for such a long time. So for thousands of years, human mankind lived without any use of fossil fuels. Um, and I want to understand why you exactly use this type of, of, of graph. Oh, it's a very simplistic uh, chart just to show that where are we now and basically where are we over the last uh, been over the last 30 years so the energy systems of the world are okay. more than 80 percent fossil fuels and you know despite all the amazing things that uh, dnv showed uh, renewables or new renewables contribution of the energy system today is is less than five percent so I think this realism of where we are is a fundamentally important Thanks. point that we don't uh, believe that we can live the lives that we're doing on the planet without the uh, energy system that we have. So it's a fundamental change that's needed and it's gonna take uh, decades to do that. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your Thanks. inspiring presentation. Um, next up, I'd like to invite uh, Yin Bo to come and uh, give us his uh, talk. Yin Bo is the Deputy Director for the Europe Office um, for the Global Energy Interconnection Development and Corpor Corporation Organization. Thank you for joining us. Finally, it's my turn. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, dear chairs, uh, it's my great honor to be here to make this presentation. And as it is still uh, Spring Festival in China, so first of all, I'd like to say Happy Chinese New Year to all the audience. This year is the year of pig. Actually, it means good fortune. Um, probably, I think maybe I'm the youngest speaker today, but I have to say that actually our organization is pretty young. Our idea, our concept is really new, but to some extent, youngsters and new things always you know, representing the future. So, first of all, uh, 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 at the beginning of, of my presentation, I would like to ask a question which is pretty common, that what kind of challenges are we facing too? I mean, for the hu all the hu human beings. A lot of people just mentioned climate change, right? And I've read, uh, once read a report dis uh, describing the climate change, and it says that actually if we, can't, if we could not achieve the goal, by the Paris Agreement, the city of Venice will be destroyed at all, all right? Totally destroyed. That is one of, one of the challenges we're facing too, but not only this. The first one is resource constraints. Actually, we can see that the fossil energy can be only, be, can be only used for at most 100 years. That means coal, but for oil, for gas, can only be used for 50 years. Just now one of the gentlemen asked a question that how can we force the traditional companies change their business? Here is the answer. If they do not make any change, make any transition, their company can be only last for at most 100 years. Yeah, um, another challenge we are facing too is the environment pollution. Here now I would like to take Beijing as an example, because I used to live in Beijing for 10 years. Every time when I talk to some foreigners that, how do you like Beijing? The last sentence they would like to say is always, oh, the air condition over there is not so good. You see, a lot of people have to wear the mask every day during, this, during the haze. But I have to say that actually, the air condition in Beijing right now has been greatly improved. This kind of condition has been greatly changed. Why? How do we achieve this? 
First of all, actually, we devote a lot to develop the renewable energy, including the hydro, wind, and solar. Actually, the capacity has been installed in China regarding with the three kind of renewable energy, all rank the first place in the world. But this is not the only thing we do. We have done. Actually, the most important thing is that we have built more than 20 ultra high voltage transmission lines through China, because actually, I think most of you would know that actually the most of the renewable energy distributed in the west and uh, a north part of China, but actually the loading center are located in the coast area, which is in the east. So we have to transmit the electricity from the west to the east, from the north to the south. So we built a lot of ultra high voltage transmission lines to transmit it, to transmit the electricity generated by renewables to the east. Then we can shut down all the coal-fired power plants surrounding Beijing, surrounding Shanghai, and including the heating system. And last year, actually Beijing, um, more than 90% heating system was, suppli was, supplied, was supplied by gas and electricity. That's our experience. We can do this to change the condition of Beijing, to improve the condition in Beijing. And how about the other places in the world? We want to share this kind of experience with all over the world. Though, so that's why the GEI idea was proposed. What is GEI? Actually, I can give you three cute words to de describe this conception. The first one is smart grid. Actually, this is not a new topic, but in our point of view, the smart grid not only just means the transmission grid, but also including the EV. As one of the gentlemen just mentioned, we have the largest, you know, the largest number of EVs in China right now, which is more than two million right now, and including some smart buildings as well. Second keywords is the ultra high voltage grid, as I just mentioned. This is the very, very important technical breakthrough which was produced in China, but based on some Western companies like ABB and Sims. Last one is clean energy. In our idea, we only focused on the clean energy because actually based on our calculation, we only have to develop 0.05% of the renewable energy, then the global demand for energy can be satisfied. Yeah, this is the picture describing the smart grid. As I mentioned, we are trying to integrate um, wind, solar, hydro, and the smart building and the smart distribution system. Here is the ultra high voltage grid. What kind of advantage of the ultra high voltage? We can see that actually it has very high transmission efficiency, very long transmission distance. Actually. Um, uh, right now, we can transmit the electricity by ultra high voltage transmission line as long as 6,000 kilometers. That means that we can actually transmit the electricity from any production area, I mean renewable energy production area, to any load center. And very low transmission loss and very less land use. We can easily figure out that. And the clean energy is the priority, as I mentioned. We don't want to develop more coal, more gas, but we only focused on the renewable energy. Okay, um, actually the GEI concept means two replacement. The first one is clean rep replacement. That means from the production side, we won't develop more fossil energy, but instead, uh, for instance, we just develop more and more renewables, as I mentioned, hydro, solar, and power, and bio. And another one is like, uh, from the consumption side, we want to raise up the level of electrification, like we just take place the traditional cars by EVs. And another replacement is the electricity replacement. We want to gradually uh, uh, raise up the level of electrification. And one restore is that mean, uh, means that we want to restore the uh, fossil energy at, as a material, but not in a kind of energy. 
and one increase as mentioned to increase the electrification. Um, you may ask, yeah, I agree that we have to develop more and more renewable energy, but why should we build the GEI? Actually, I think there is, this is uh, one of the important reasons that actually, as I mentioned, China, the renewable energy distribution is not so evenly, but this kind of condition is the same all, the, all over the world. Actually, one of the gentlemen just asked that, um, what can we do for the developing countries, especially in Africa? As everyone knows that actually we have very abundant renewable energies in Africa, like solar, like hydro, Grand Inga, right? But actually it cannot be, it, it cannot be consumed by Africa itself, right? So if we want to develop more and more energy, uh, renewable energy in Africa, then we have to transmit those electricities to some other loading centers, like Europe. Actually, the Europe, the Southern Europe has been discussing uh, about this with Morocco, with Tunis for a long time, but we still have a long way to go. But this shows that actually this is one of the best ways for us to solve this problem. This map shows that actually we can figure out that most of the renewables um, energy resources are distributed in some special areas like Sahara, like in the West, East, uh, in the West Asia. And how can we achieve GEI? First of all, I, ha I have to highlight the technical breakthroughs in this field at first because just imagine uh, what kind of great changes the internet has brought to us in the last decades, right? The technical things can, you know, uh, can eventually change our life. So right now we have ultra high voltage technologies and we also have some uh, members which is uh, very famous in, the, in Europe like Sims ABB. They also, they also have very good technicals related to uh, GI. So that's why we think Techno technically, actually, GEI is feasible right now. Economically, um, you know, uh, based on our calculation, actually, in the t either year of 2030, the cost of renewable energies would be much lower, would be lower or the same as the fossil energy. So in the future, we think the traditional uh, energy won't be that competitive with uh, renewable energies. Okay, uh, here are some, uh, some studies which has been existed for decades uh, talking about GEI. The first one is uh, one of the reports I read last year. It was uh, published by the Joint Research Center of European Parliament, which is quite interesting, describing the, uh, their planning works starting from China, Xinjiang province to Germany. And the, Another map shows that uh, it shows the uh, the planning of the uh, ten years network of development plan of NSOE, showing the regional uh, interconnection in Europe. And there are some other maps. You, you see that one. That one is uh, developed by PIDA, showing the uh, energy interconnection in Africa. Okay, here is the map the, describing the. Uh, showing the interconnection in Asia. Uh, actually, one of the guests has asked me that, do you have any existing project which is undergoing in, in, in the world? Actually, right now, there is specific project uh, which was undertaken by the government uh, that is from China to Myanmar to Bangladesh. We have signed an MOU uh, among those uh, governments and we are doing the feasibility studies Okay, um, uh, in the past, you know, when I present this kind of idea to the audiences, the most um, uh, often questions was raised is that, uh, how could you achieve this uh, very, very big goal, uh, considering there are very, very huge differences politically? But right now, I have to say that, to dream big is always good. And right now, we, the cooperation has been, you know, uh, undertaking all the all over the world, you know, um, we have actually the GEI has been incorporated to the 
2030 agenda for sustainable goals last year because we have um, signed an MOU with UNDESA uh, and we have uh, released the GEI action plan to promote the, the agenda for sustainable development. Uh, besides, actually, during the COP24, which was held last year in Poland, in Katowice, we also signed an MOU with the uh, UNFCCC. We want to, is, uh, we want to you know, enhance our cooperation, and we want to do some research together to implement the Paris Agreement, because actually Paris Agreement is kind of political um, agreement, but we, for our, uh, from our perspective, from the bottom-up side, we want to do something which is specifically can promote this kind of, kind of idea. Yes, as I mentioned, not only uh, with the UN entities, but we also signed a lot of MOUs with some local governments because actually GEI uh, is a kind of infrastructure, so we have to cooperate with the local governments. So we so also signed a lot of MOUs and also uh, some, uh, some, uh, some, uh, some associations like the Af African Union, Arab League. Here are the pictures about those MOUs. Um, as I mentioned, it is a big dream, so we would achieve it step by step. First of all, we want to achieve the domestic interconnection. I think by the year 2025, we can achieve the domestic interconnection. And then the intercontinental interconnection, just like Europe, Africa. Right now, we, actually, the existing grid in Europe is quite well interconnected. And we think by the year of 2040, uh, I think the uh, 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 2035, actually, the inter intercontinental interconnection would be achieved. And finally, the global, global interconnection would be achieved by the year of 2050. Uh, here is the picture showing the backbone grid of the global energy interconnection. And so what kind of comp uh, comprehensive benefits of GEI we can see? First of all, the GEI is creating a new energy and electricity pattern. Because actually, uh, I've read a lot of articles describing that maybe we would, maybe the backbone grid uh, especially the GEI is not needed because we would use the distributed uh, renewable energy system like the the small scale wind power pa uh, wind pl uh, power plants or the small scale solar panels. But actually, as I mentioned, if we want to uh, compromise all the sustainable development goals, like we want to overcome the poverty problem in Africa. What shall we do? If we would we just use the small panels, this kind of problem cannot be overcome, cannot be solved. So we still think that large scale uh, renewable ener energy resources development is quite needed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to speed up. Okay. <laughs> so uh, because of the time, I would just si skip over. This the past slides, and I, I, at last I would like to introduce our organization, just one minute. Um, our organization was established in Beijing two years ago. We are very young, but right now we have more, uh, more than 600 members, including the manufacturers, um, banks, uh, financial firms, think tanks, universities, and some, uh, some uh, Greek companies. And we have more than 15 overseas offices, and. We have done a lot of research works, which, which is open to the public, and you can download from our website. And at last, thank you so much, and you're welcome to visit Beijing and our headquarters, because we have very good showcase in our headquarters. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Mr. Bo. We've got time for one quick question. Uh, we've got a question here. I, I just wanted to thank you for highlighting the interlinkages between climate action, accelerating climate action, and helping solve some of our other sustainable development challenges like poverty, health, and air pollution. That's Over to you, correct. Connie. You. Yeah, my name is Connie Hedegaard. Sorry. Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. I just have one question out of curiosity, because when we take the Belt and Road Initiative, could you tell us sort of what is the proportion between fossil fuel investments there when it comes to the energy side, respectively the renewables investments in the Belt and Road Initiative? You mean investment? 
Yeah, you invest a lot through the Belt and Road Initiative, and you invest a lot in infrastructure and energy. Mm -hmm. What is the share of fossil and coal investments compared to renewables? Actually, in our future plan, we don't think we have to use coal at all. So actually, uh, based on our calculation, as I mentioned, we only have to develop 0.05% uh, of the renewable energy, then all the global demand of energy can be satisfied. So actually, uh, no matter, actually we are not very in line with Belt and Road. Belt and Road, you know, other, as you mentioned, the other energy uh, kinds has been included, but in our plan, we don't think energy, uh, we, we don't think the fossil energy development is so important. So we just focus on the part of the renewable energy under the, the Belt and Road framework. That's what I want to say. I don't know whether... I Just one quick question up front. Maybe we can have f further discussions in the, during the coffee break. Mm -hmm. Because we are not representing the Chinese government, so we don't talk about too much about the Ben and Rose, something like that. But, you know, <laughs> because actually interconnection is one of the important ingredients under the, the Belt and Road uh, initiative. Well, thank you very much for this presentation. You, you, you. may know that in this university, we have trained over 10,000 Chinese experts from different cities in China on problems of sustainability. And one of the first uh, participant was Chen Jining, oh. who later became president of Tsinghua and three years ago, minister of the environment in Beijing. Mm -hmm. And now I think he's the mayor of Beijing. Uh, this being said, uh, we're very pleased that uh, China is doing so much in improving uh, the uh, carbon imprint. But I would like to say also that um, I imagine that it, will, it continues to export coal uh, to a large extent. And uh, it, it burns less coal in, in its own frontiers, borders, but it sends coal somewhere else. And I wonder whether you could comment on that. Thank you. You know, I have to say that actually before I joined Geico, I was working in the Shenhua Group, which has ranked in the uh, in the least. Actually, it's a coal far. Uh, it's a coal company. It's the largest coal company in the world. Uh, I, I have to say that, say that early uh, that actually China is the biggest coal import country, but not exporting country. You know, right now, China, China is, fire, is firing a lot of coal from Indonesia, from Australia, including America. Yes, so we're not, actually we're not exporting so much, so much coal, actually. We are actually using the coal produced in the other countries. Right now, I have to say that actually the China is the largest coal consumption country. But I think this kind of condition can be gradually changed because we can, Rome was not built in one day. We cannot change the condition in China in one day. <laughs> so we're, but we are focus on, focusing on the energy transition. We are doing that step that by step. That's why our organization was established in Beijing and registered in Beijing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Bo. Um, thank you very much. We're going to take a 20-minute break and have some coffee. But maybe just quickly to summarize, we heard from the science community that, you know, a, a, a world warmer than 1.5 degrees is definitely dangerous and it's something we should be preventing. We've heard from the business community how they're ramping up their climate plans, how they're engaging and transitioning to a low-carbon uh, resilient future. And and, and we're going to continue that discussion after the break, looking at corporations and how they can ramp up climate action. So please join us back here in 20 minutes um, at 11.40. Thank you very much.